Hey there, I'm at Hillsdale College with Tony Swinehart, who's a professor of biology here. And uh, he knows a lot about fossils, because you, you know about marine biology, right? I've done a little bit of marine biology, freshwater biology, and I know enough about paleontology to be dangerous. All right, well, let's be dangerous. So <laughs> right. you're going to show us how to identify some stuff that we might find in Michigan? Sure, that sounds like a good place to start. Okay, sounds good. All right, what do we have here, Tony? Well, you know, we're going to try to do some justice to fossil identification. Obviously, we're not going to be able to do a lot in one or two or even three videos. Fossil identification can be very challenging uh, because unlike a living thing, you don't always have all the parts. You may just have a part. You can't look at its behavior. You can't do DNA and so on. But obviously, at, uh, at the level of kingdom and phylum, you know, at the higher levels, we can make some distinctions between different types of fossils. And one of the simplest types of animals, uh, other than sponges, are corals. And it's also a fossil that we, uh, you know, commonly find in Michigan. If it's not corals, it's brachiopods or crinoids. They're among the most common things we find in Michigan because most of Michigan's rocks represent a time in Michigan when Michigan was a shallow tropical sea say in the middle Paleozoic. So you're going to find a lot of marine fossils. You're not going to find terrestrial fossils unless you're talking about mastodons in the Pleistocene or something in relatively recent history. So corals can divide, be divided up into two major groups. You've got uh, rugose corals, like the horn corals, and then you've got tabulate corals, like this one, uh, well, Fabocytes is a member of the of the tabulate corals. And the rugose corals, despite these being called tabulate and these being called rugose, these actually do have internal structures called tabulae, as do these, but they're slightly different. Um, we're not going to get into too much technical about the difference between rugose and tabulates. Uh, I will say that uh, one general thing to distinguish the two that can be helpful is if you see septa, like these little, let's see, like these little lines that radiate. If you see septa in the coralite, you're generally dealing with a rugose coral. If you don't see any septa in the coralite, if it's just sort of hollow, um, oh, I don't have any. Well, here's one. This is from the Silurian of the UP. Uh, but you're not seeing any of those septa that are in there. That that's typical, more of a of a uh, of a tabulate. But just when you thought that was relatively simple, there are colonial rugose corals. So this one's from the Ordovician of Indiana. This one's from Northern Ohio. This one's from Michigan. The Petoskey stones are actually a colonial rugose coral, and you can see that they do in fact have those those septa. Now this one hasn't been prepped. So they're kind of under rock, but this one would have septa too. So this is a solitary rugose. These are colonial rugose. These are tabulates. And these solitary rugose corals mean, means that there's just one animal per exoskeleton. So this was one animal, this is one animal, this is one animal. Your um, Petoskey stone, genus Hexagonaria, a colonial rugose, each one of those, as you know, had an individual animal. So it's a colony of lots and lots of animals. So each one of these coralites had what's called a coral polyp in it. So I made a cast of this fossil. Now this one I have, I have prepped because most of this was buried under rock. So I've exposed these three horn corals. And I thought, boy, it'd be neat to kind of show people that these aren't teeth, uh, they aren't horns, um, they're corals. It'd be neat to make a cast of it and then paint it up and add some soft parts to show what they would have looked like when they were alive. And so here you see a cast of this. I've added some grout here to make it look like seafloor and I found these little anemones at the Walmart. And uh, basically these would be the, the coral polyps. So there'd be one coral polyp per coral. And if I were doing this one, there'd be a ton bunch of tiny little polyps. And those being a member of the phylum Cnidaria, uh, the corals, they have one of the characteristics of phylum is they have stinging tentacles. So these 
tentacles would have had special cells called nidocysts with organelles called nematocysts that shoot out like a harpoon and can stun and incapacitate their prey and then they can take that prey in through their mouth and digest it in the simple gastrovascular cavity and whatever's undigestible just gets puked back out the mouth. They have no anus. And so uh, so that's, uh, that's and so corals come in all varieties. You've got the solitary rugose, you got the colonial rugose, you have some that encrust. So here's a an old Ordovician brachiopod and you see that it's got what looks like coral on there because it is it's encrusting on brachiopods um, you've got some that branch uh, this is a piece of a branch this one actually comes from Rockport Quarry in Michigan um, and this one's a branching coral and then others are more like a coral head like you see here so are these individual animals in each one of those little yes hexagons? the exteriors here so they would have you can kind of see in there that's where the polyps would have been exposed and quite frankly, the interior of this are where old polyps would have been. So the only living polyps are those that are on the outermost margin. They would have colonized a layer of the previous group of, that die, and so the coral just grows up in layers with only the outside portion being living polyps, the rest being skeletons of previous generations of the coral. Oh, okay. And, uh, and of course, here's the thing. Getting corals to genus name, you know, so people talk about Favocytes, and by the way, it is pronounced Favocytes. Favocytes is not plural. That's the genus name. So we don't say, fa it's a Favocyte. We say it's Favocytes. So you see, you hear that name thrown around. You hear Cladopora thrown around. I think Rob will have a picture of what people often call Cladopora. I hesitate to put a genus on those if I'm just if I find something out in the field uh, because there are branching members of Favocytes that look a lot like Cladopora and they're both in the same order Favocytida so I don't know if that's Favocytes or Cladopora and the way to find out is you get a, a technical paper that has maybe a dichotomous key or a description and you'd have to measure the the little holes where the polyps are the coralites and look at the nature of the of the uh, corallum wall and this kind of thing. So if it looks like this, like a, your typical tabulate coral, whether it's branching or it's, it's mound forming like this, I just say it's a member of the favicidida or a favicidid coral. That way I'm less likely to be incorrect. If I call it cladopora and it's not, it's actually favicides and I'm technically incorrect. But if I call it a favicidid coral, which is higher up in the classification, then I'm okay. I'm not necessarily wrong. So, however, now that we talked about corals, there are some other things that kind of look like corals but aren't. They're calcium carbonate exoskeletons. They may be branching. They may be encrusting. But they're not, not only not corals, but they're not even closely related to corals. And those are the bryozoans. So over here we have examples of bryozoans. And you can see that some of them are branching. I've got ones that are more massive, like this, and like this, that are kind of like a coral head would be, but they're not corals. You've got some that uh, kind of look like a fan, you know, with little square holes in them. Here's another one. This is uh, called a fenestrate bryozoan. And actually, those little holes aren't where the actual individual animals live. They actually live in tinier holes in the veins. But uh, these are bryozoans. And so if you see one of these and you see a branching coral, how do you know which one's a coral and which one's a bryozoan? That's my question. <laughs> well, a, a, a general rule in most corals, when you look at them, even the, even the ones with tiny little coralites where the polyps live. So each one of those holes is where a polyp lives. You don't really have to squint to see those. No. Nope. Now on a bryozoan, you tip it, you know, unless you've got like some kind of crazy vision, you're either not going to see them or you're going to have to squint to see them. So when we look at this one or this one, you might be able to see it when the camera zoomed in, but if your eyes are like mine, you don't see any holes in there. You see a branch and maybe some bumps, but you don't see any holes. 
Okay, I have a question. So this one, I see holes, the little square holes yep, you're talking yep. about, but you said that they're even smaller holes than that. Yeah, those are actually just, they're like a series of veins that create those square holes, and the water just goes right through those. That's just a, it's just like a piece of window screen, and the, the, the zoesia, that's what we call the cavities in which the zoids or the animals that make up the bryozoa are called are actually on the on the uh, veins so to speak and not in the little square holes that you see okay and we're going to show uh, a picture through the microscope that shows you what this one looks like under magnification and you'll see that there are in fact holes there millions of them uh, that we call zoesia and that's where the individual animals live in in this county so the bryozoans are i think almost exclusively colonial and they look a lot like the polyp of a coral. So they have this tentacle thing here that, that fits down into the little hole of the zoesium. But these are far more complicated uh, animals in, uh, than corals because corals have true tissues, but they don't have any organs. Um, these have not only true tissues but organs and organ systems. They have a complete digestive system which includes a mouth and an anus. Uh, the tentacles don't have stinging cells like a coral does. They just sort of filter feed. They might have some kind of sticky substance. But uh, far more quote unquote advanced in terms of organ and tissue complexity and so on. Even though they're extremely tiny. Size is not necessarily an indicator of complexity. So uh, we'll show you some pictures of, of these. So if you find something that's kind of branching, but you really have to squint to see the, the zoesia or the holes or the coralites, uh, you're probably dealing with a bryozoan rather than a coral. And uh, if you see something that's obvious where the polyp lived, it's probably dealing with a coral. And then this is a type of bryozoan found in Mississippian deposits that's called Archime genus Archimedes. And it, they named it that because it kind of looks like Archimedes' screw, uh, you know, that, that, that he invented to pump water up through, uh, you know, back in the Greek times and so on. Uh, but the, the rest of it's broken off. This would have had a window screen-like spiraling net that followed around that. Uh, I don't know, what it would, how would you characterize that? It's just kind of a spirally net and this is just the central axis it sticks out like like an inch or so from from the center yeah right? it's like taking a one of them uh oh what do they call those those defoliating things and kind of exfoliators that oh. you use in the shower yeah, kind yeah. of twist in it but and this is just the central axis that's called archimedes okay something just occurred to me um i'm still bothered by this having little holes and those having little holes these you said are square well, let me, let me, uh, are, are the, uh, these are not square. They're hexagons. Wait, wait a minute. These are typically polygonal. Okay. Typically so, hexagons because they tessellate nicely. And ty together. Typically, typically hexagonal or at least polygonal. Okay. Uh, now if you're talking about the actual zoids here, they're, they're typically going to be round. And the, the real little ones. The, yeah. The, the bryozoan. Yeah. Okay. Now okay. these aren't, those squares aren't there, aren't zoesia. Right. They're just holes in a flat matrix okay and uh but you'll typically see uh on a bryozoan you'll have this long zoesium and then an opening at the end like that whereas these are just a polygonal uh uh design or geometry okay okay so one common uh issue with fossil identification is somebody finds a fossil that looks like a clam and so they say, oh, I found a fossil of a clam. Well, um, if you're in Michigan especially, or anywhere in the Paleozoic, especially the middle to early Paleozoic, um, in, you know, when in doubt, based on sheer probability, you probably have a, what's called a brachiopod, which may look kind of like a clam, but they're actually t totally unrelated. I mean, they're they're just not anywhere near the same even phylum. Um, but you can find fossil clams in the middle Paleozoic. In fact, there are Devonian sites, similar age to what we have here in Michigan, uh, that are rich in actual clam fossils as well as brachiopods. So it's helpful to know the difference. First, I'm going to tell, talk about 
the difference between a clam and a brachiopod, and at least based on the shell. And then I'm going to talk about why they're totally unrelated, because they're the animals that that produce the shell are vastly different. So on brachiopods, if I take a brachiopod shell and I hold it like that, where the broad part you're looking down on the broadest part, it's totally symmetrical. So if I cut it in half right there, I'm going to have a mirror image. I mean, this side is going to be exactly like that side. Okay. So that's symmetrical if you're looking down on it like that. But if I turn it like this, and I look down that way, you'll see that the, the two shells that make up the thing are not symmetrical. The top shell, which is this part right here, this triangular part right here, that whole, that's the top shell, is a totally different shape than the bottom shell. So I couldn't draw a line through here and have this shell being exactly the same as the lower shell. So they're symmetrical this way, but not when you look at them on end view. Does that make sense, Rob? Yeah, that you? does make sense. Okay, sometimes, like this one, you might think is just one shell, but it's actually both shells, and the space that the animal occupied is just tiny. Yeah, I always thought I was getting one, because you find, you know, modern well, clam shells on a beach, you find just one of them. Absolutely, but if this... You could find just the top shell of this, but if you had and you turned it over and you looked at the concave side, you wouldn't see these ribs here, these costae. It would just be kind of smooth, maybe some muscle scars and so on, but you wouldn't see these radiating lines. Okay. So that's an indication that you've got basically a, an upper shell and a lower shell, and they're, and they're in there like spoons. And, that's, and there's just a thin space in there where the animal lives, and they can open and close it, but... This is a, what we call a concavo convex. So you've got one that's concave and the other shell is convex. And uh, obviously those are not symmetrical. If you, you know, if you look at it that way, half and half, same. If you look at it that way, obviously those shells are not symmetrical. You've got one shell that's a different morphology than the other. Now let's look at a clam. Clam, if you look at it that way, um, this is off center. This is called the umbo. This is the swelling at the hinge area. That's not, you can't cut that down any way and end up having a mirror image. Nope. It's, it's asymmetrical. But if we turn it like this, if you draw a line down there, the top shell and the bottom shell, or the left and the right, whatever you want, however you want to say it, technically left and right, because these or inserted in the mud like that. It's this, it's symmetrical. This is the same as this one, which is not the case on a brachiopod. It's just the opposite. Brachiopod, symmetrical, asymmetrical. Clam, asymmetrical, symmetrical. Oh, okay. There are some exceptions to to that rule, but in terms of any fossils of bivalves and brachiopods that you might find in the middle Paleozoic of Michigan, uh, these general rules of symmetry hold. So all the clams or bivalves and brachiopods kind of look similar in terms of the fact that they both have a bivalve shell. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they are uh, unrelated, totally unrelated, um, different phyla and so on. Uh, and that's in large part, well, almost exclusively due to their morphology. Uh, if you look at the, the morphology of a of a clam, maybe one that you might be familiar with, the clams that you find around here and the ocean and so on and so forth. Uh, many of them have a muscular foot that they use to move through the sediment. And the and in that case, the umbo or hinge region is sort of facing up and the lower portion of the clam is embedded in the sediment and they move around the sediment that way and take in water through an end pore, filter out food items, plankton and so on. And, and expel the water through an excurrent pore. Um, there are some bivalves, obviously, that attach uh, where the commissure or opening is facing up, but uh, either way, they're, they're still primarily a, a filter feeding organism through an incurrent and excurrent pore. Whereas in a brachiopod, the primary method of feeding is through what is called a lophophore, which is sort of a tentacled mouth, so to speak. Uh, and it's oftentimes all spiraled up in there like that. They can attach, uh, many attach, at least at some point in their life, with a little stalk called a pedicle, and, uh, and then they filter out food with this tentacled 
loaf of four. Um, in fact, uh, there's another phylum of organisms, a closely related phylum to the brachiopods, that also have a lophophore feeding apparatus, and that is the bryozoan. So those are two closely related phy phyla. But the internal anatomy of a brachiopod is far different than that of a bivalve mollusk, and so that's why, although they look similar, they can be quite they're they're phylogenetically they're distant but they're not they're not closely related different phyla. Uh, far different phyla. Uh, how do we know? Uh, well, uh, we do have living brachiopods. So we can look at the shell morphology of living brachiopods to help us determine that the fossil, the fossil ones are in fact brachiopods. Moreover, we occasionally find the internal structures or some of the internal structures of brachiopods preserved, mainly the support structure for the lophophore, which is called a brachidium or sometimes spiralia. And uh, uh, so we occasionally, rather than sort of a geode where you just find crystals inside the shell, you occasionally get preserved internal structures. And that tells us that what we're dealing with is a brachiopod based on comparison with modern analogs, i.e. living brachiopods. So now uh, some people uh, ask, well, how do you tell the difference between a snail, which is in the uh, which is a mollusk of the class Gastropoda, and uh, an ammonite or a nautiloid that's a mollusk in the class Cephalopoda, so totally different classes. Well, it, it could be a challenge, especially if you're in a geologic deposit that's of an age where, where amino both ammonites and gastropods are common or can be found. In some cases, if you're in the Ordovician, you're not going to get ammonites or ammonoid, you know, coiled cephalopods. You're just going to get orthoconic nautiloids, the straight-shelled cephalopods. So if you're in the Ordovician or earlier, you don't have to worry about whether you have a coiled cephalopod or an ammonoid. But in the middle of the Devonian of Michigan, there is a possibility of coming across a coiled uh, cephalopod, a, a nautiloid. And uh, Oh, I'm sorry, a, a, a coiled cephalopod, an ammonoid. And um, one way, one, one thing you might want to look at first is that here's, here's a, an ammonoid or a coiled cephalopod. Notice that the spiral, you know, from the earlier ages of the shell, because it, it just continues to grow and get bigger as it goes around. This, the earlier whorls are pretty much centralized in the middle. Now, there's still some rock here, but if I were to peel that rock away, those worlds are pretty much centralized into one plane. Um, and that's, that's somewhat unusual for a snail. And a snail, if it's what we call planispiral, or it spirals in largely one plane, even if it's relatively flat, you usually have the earlier worlds, the spire, sort of leaning more to one side than the other so that you have an umbilicus over here and the spire over here. That you don't typically see on ammonoids. There are some exceptions. There's a species in Texas that's conospiral, but in general, the, these ammonoids are really planispiral. The other difference is, is that ammonoids have internal chambers. Then the walls of these internal chambers are called septa. Snails don't have those. So if you look inside a snail, uh, the shell would be entirely hollow throughout that spiral. No walls inside there. Now, we have to be careful about using the term ammonite. So ammonoid is basically a, I mean there are there are coiled nautiloids like the modern nautilus, but ammonoids are a special type of cephalopod that's coiled like this. And we can distinguish the major groups by the complexity of the sutures that, that form the walls of these chambers. And the very simplest of coiled ammonoids has just sort of a gentle sinuous septa where it meets the outer shell. So where this wall meets the outer shell kind of looks like that. Those are the kind that you could find in the Devonian of Michigan possibly. And those, that's called goniotitic sutures, and those coiled ammonoids are called goniotites. As you get up into the Mississippian and so on, 
the sutured patterns become a little more complex and those are called serotitic or serotites and then as you get up into the uh, out of the Paleozoic and into the Mesozoic and so on you get these complex look at the complex sutures there where that wall that septal wall meets the outer wall looks like puzzle pieces and that's called ammonitic and thus that those would be the true ammonites so even if you found a coiled ammonite in, uh, ammonoid in Michigan a coiled cephalopod it would not be an ammonite it would be a gonia type because we don't I don't think there's any rocks in Michigan that expose that are of the age that would expose uh, true ammonites so actually in the Paleozoic rocks of Michigan that are exposed, like in the Alpena area, uh, like some places up near uh, Petoskey and so on. There's actually some exposures in southern Michigan that are middle Devonian. Uh, trilobites really aren't, quite frankly, that uncommon. Uh, they're highly desirable. I mean, I call people that hunt exclusively for trilobites cherry pickers because they just want the cool trilobites and they're not recognizing all the cool other brachiopods and things. But, but they're more common, quite frankly, as bits and pieces. So you might find a trilobut where you just have what's called the pygidium, you know, that butt end. Or you might just find a trilobite cephalon or head or you might find a few segments. And there's actually more trilobites in the fossil record than there actually ever were individual trilobites. And the reason for that is they're an arthropod and they have to molt to grow. So there are probably many times more trilobite molts than there are individual trilobites in the fossil record because each trilobite molded many times during its life, leaving behind multiple fossils. So a lot of times you just find bits and pieces of their molts. But if you find one enrolled or complete like this, you're dealing with the actual animal, dead animal, and not just one of his uh, exoskeleton uh, sheds or molts. So uh, they're really cool. They're, uh, they're, uh, uh, they're in their own class, Trilobita, uh, and uh, really cool little organisms. We don't often see the appendages uh, that they use to move preserve, but there are, there's a place, for instance, in the Ordovician of New York where not only are the trilobites preserved in, uh, I think, in iron pyrite, so they're kind of gold, but even the legs are preserved, and they've even found eggs in them, and they find that in that particular species, the eggs were uh, carried up in the, up in the cephalon, up, up near the head, instead of in the rear like crayfish and stuff do in the swimmerettes and the abdomen. Now, how many legs do these have? Do these have a whole bunch of a legs? A whole bunch of Okay. And, and, and we're going to be talking a little bit about ichno fossils or trace fossils. And we find trace fossils that are basically trilobite tracks. And they've been able to use those tracks and morphology from fossils like those in New York and other places that show the legs to really figure out exactly how they moved and the, the mechanics of their movement and that kind of thing. But you can find trilobite trackways. Um, uh, so there's in Michigan, the typical genus, the most common genus in our Devonian deposits is Eldregiops, which looks similar to this. this. These are actually from Morocco. I, don't, I know it's a phacopid, but I don't know if it's genus Eldregiops, but probably not. But uh, they look a lot like this. You typically find them enrolled or laying prone. This is an Ordovician uh, from Morocco, trilobite from the Ordovician of Morocco called uh, uh, Flexicalamini Osregui or something like that. Is that going to be on the test? Yeah. <laughs> uh, not, not if spelling counts. But uh, <laughs> Now this one is a Cambrian trilobite called Elrathia kingii from Utah. And then this one, the new genus name is, I think, Agonistus or something because it's it's uh it's uh what do you call that when you you're you're uh, uh you, you don't know if you believe in god or agnostic not. agnostic this one doesn't know which direction is going oh <laughs> it okay. actually does have a head and a tail end but they're they're blind and you can you can it's hard to distinguish the pygidium from the cephalon now is that so a the, is that a baby or is that are that's they a little... pretty much full grown it's okay a blind uh full grown it, it might there might be bigger representatives but they're not much bigger than that 
So those are the, and then this is a big Ordovician trilobite uh, from uh, Ohio called Isotelus maximus. And there are other arthropods. Not all the arthropods were trilobites. There were uh, shrimp-like organisms. Um, and uh, among other things, there were some really tiny shrimp-like organisms. So we're going to get a picture of these under the microscope so that you can see the detail. But these things, as tiny as grains of sand, are actually the bivalve carapace of a type of shrimp called an ostracod, commonly called seed shrimp. You only find these, that's another thing, a lot of people they just look for the big stuff, but if you go to a rock outcrop where the rock is breaking down, grab some handfuls of that broken down, basically sand or mud, and put it through a fine sieve and put it on a microscope, there's a whole world of microfossils to be found. Huh. Another common group of fossils that we find in Michigan are the echinoderms, particularly the crinoids. So what we mostly find when we're out on the beaches and so on are either crinoids embedded in rock or we might find a loose crinoid. And some people call them Indian beads, uh, but they're, they're basically part of the stem of an animal that was attached to the substrate. Uh, and so this would be the stalk, and then these are the feeding arms, and this, this part of the organism is called the calyx with feet in the feeding arms, and these tiniest of little arms, the very fine ones, uh, are, are where the filtration of the food, those are called pinules, and, the, and uh, that's where the filtration of the tiny plankton happens, and then there's a groove that goes down the arm, and that's how they uh, shuttle food to the mouth of the thing. Um, Where is something like that from? Now this one uh, is purchased and I don't remember where that came from. Okay. It's quite, well first of all you can imagine the amount of prep work that goes to prep out those tiny oh, little. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, these are usually found, so normally when these things die they just break up. These are each one of these segments of the column of the uh, stalk is a single calcite crystal and they tend to when the animal dies they just break apart really easily and this all becomes d disaggregated mm -hmm. so when you find them like this it's usually a storm deposit oh. so we had a hurricane or some storm that quickly buried animals alive and then you get this beautiful articulation so finding them like this is hard to do sometimes they're not as common and they're extremely valuable because collectors love them. And so to, to buy a real fossil like that, of course the cost of the prep and everything, it's quite expensive. I found calyces. You know, it's not that out of the ordinary if you're in a rock. I found out, just the but, base of them. Yeah, you've been finding, and these are beautiful. I mean, I think this is genus Magistocrinus or something like that. I'd have to double check. These are from the Thunder Bay Formation in Michigan. And, um, so which is Devonian. Uh, here's a, you know, the arms are missing, but the calyx where the stalk attached, mm -hmm. you know, if we could find a little thin stalk in here, that's where it would go. You know, and then it would be, now modern, now we do have modern crinoids that, that survive, most crinoid species went extinct, but we do have representatives that still live today, and they, they don't attach anymore. They kind of crawl around like a brittle starfish or something. They don't have stalks where they attach anymore, but most of the Paleozoic ones attach via these stalks. Um, some of them have spines, so you may, we don't have any in the Paleozoic, of, or in the Devonian of Michigan, we don't have any echinoids like uh, sea urchins and things, but you may find some spines that were part of crinoids, crinoid spines. Now where would those there. be in the, in the uh, they would be uh, typically up uh, on or near the calyx, I okay. believe. And then you got all kinds of interesting geometry inside these. Of course, echinoderms typically have a pentamerous or five-parted design or architecture. Right, and so find you'll the find one the with this. Yeah, the hole has five stars. The, what, the hole's what we call the lumen, and it'll sometimes be five. These are little bits and pieces and spines of echinoderms that my some of my students found by while collecting mud you know from a rock exposure and then sieving and 
in uh, pulling out the remains. So some of them can be quite tiny. Um, here's a here's a stalk, you know, that's still articulated. Oh, that's Doesn't have the calyx on it, unfortunately. Some other stalks, and so what happens when those get broken up is they end up like this. I collected these as a kid in this playground in my elementary school. I was just I was. They called me the fossil freak. <laughs> Everyone, that's not nice. No, but it was true. And <laughs> and they went. And I'd go out there, and that's how I spent my recess. Call me a geek. I don't care. But uh, you know what? Uh, there was this one girl. I still remember her name. They took a family vacation out west to Colorado, and and she comes back, and she had collected a bag of rocks for me, <laughs> and I was just blown away that she was actually thinking about me on her vacation with her parents and that took the time to collect and bring me those rocks. So not ev not everybody does not appreciate rock geeks and fossil geeks no, and fossil free. We're not that bad. <laughs> this was supposed to go into the this was supposed to go into the echinoderm shelf. So this is a 3D print showing where the septal uh, uh, walls meet up with the outer oh, edge okay. of the ammonite. So you can see the ammonite, right, and and then you can see the septal walls as they link with the outer wall of the ammonite. I don't. Somebody put this in the wrong drawer. So, but and then the the blastoids. What can you tell oh, me about those? Yeah, these are very similar in crinoids to their uh, feeding type and so on. They typically short stalked. Um, they had some some arms on them. Um, Honestly, I don't remember the details of the anatomy that distinguishes them from crinoids. That's because I obviously most of my life I uh, I haven't really dealt with these much. I I just started to find those up at Partridge Point, you know, in the Thunder Bay, mm -hmm. and uh, that that's sort of been one of my first experiences with them. There's another site down in Indiana that has them, but I don't remember the the specific details of how we distinguish the blastoids from the from the crinoids but they typically are relatively short stalk compared to the crinoids and they have this really fascinating uh, architecture you can't really see it here but it, it almost looks like uh, a grill of an old an old uh, car or something these these interesting oh. fine lines that I, I don't see on this and, one. And that's one I found uh, at Partridge Point. And that's one of the bigger ones. That, There's a that's smaller the large... species there that uh, I can never find the little things because I just don't find well, them. Well, my They're problem small. is I see the small ones, and then I see you guys come up with these monster ones. I'm like, why, don't, why can't I oh, find God. those? I'd rather find the big ones, I guess, <laughs> just because they're big. But I'm also better at seeing the big ones. <laughs> and here's, a, just for, here's an imprint of the face of a crinoid columnal and those you can see have some fine architecture oh, yeah. too where the where the two segments connect yeah, I've seen that in some that I find up around Alpina too yeah not that big so, but they, they call them sea lilies but they're actually not obviously not a plant at all they're they're a uh, an animal echinoderm closely related to starfish sea cucumbers sea urchins uh, brittle stars and so on I think everything we've talked about today has been an animal, hasn't it? Yes. Yeah. No yeah. Plants, There's, even though a lot there, of them look like plants. So, I've been involved in discovering some algae, some fossil algae that is non-calcareous from Michigan. Um, it's really rare. The kinds of environments that preserve non-calcareous algae are unique and rare. Um, there, you're generally we're not close to land in the Devonian here in our rocks, so. You generally don't find any plant bits. There's, there were, by the time of the Devonian, terrestrial plants, including seedless vascular plants and that kind of thing. Uh, but we just don't find them in our Devonian rocks. We do have some Mississippian rocks, um, which certainly would have had plants, land plants by then. And that was, that was relatively close to shore at the time, because they are sandstones, which would indicate relative proximity to land. But uh, I've never really found any Mississippian plants, but there are some Pennsylvanian plants up in, uh, in central Michigan. I'm not going to indicate exactly where because a lot of that's probably private property and you know, we don't want people mucking around there, but there are some really nicely preserved plant fossils in certain part of Michigan. 
Well, thanks a lot for that. That was uh, very informative. I, I know I can be a little more dangerous now, too, on the beach. <laughs> we can throw rocks and fossils, right? <laughs> yeah, skip them. <laughs> it's been my pleasure. Appreciate it. So if you guys want to learn about rocks that aren't fossils, I'll link another video here with other professors who will teach you about rocks in Lake Superior. That's a really good video, so go check it out.